Uh, I guess I'll preface this game by saying that this was a really, it was from the uh, Imre Koenig Memorial Tournament in San Francisco. Uh, it took place, I'm trying to remember exactly when this game took place. It did not take place in 2020, which is actually really funny. I think it's because I threw this into a Leech study and then threw it out of one or something. But I'm trying to remember the year of this game. It's actually, it was a long, long time ago, though. I think it was, I want to say 2007. Uh, it was before I became a GM. So, uh, quite honestly, if you're asking about chess base, I think it's good for any level. If you're serious about studying chess and you're serious about inputting your games and searching games, chess base is an invaluable tool. You can get by without it more now than you used to be able to, but it's just good if you play in tournaments and play people who you can look up and have like openings you databases you want to prepare and stuff like that uh in any case this was one of the more memorable games i've had in my career um it was really quite a fun game to play and uh it was i haven't looked at it in a very long time so i reviewed it for this lecture and stuff like that but i really wanted to show it because it has so many instructive points and overall it just was really even though i ended up losing the game it was one of the most memorable games i played and i really enjoyed it and i wanted to share it with you guys um, so i could share kind of the, some of the lessons i've learned from it myself so to start with back in those days this was pre-2010 so i was primarily an e4 player back then nowadays i play mostly d4 but back then e4 was my primary weapon uh e4 e5 knight f3 knight c6 bishop b5 so we played the lopez or spanish knight f6 castles bishop b7 rook e1 b5 bishop b3 and castles so uh he decided to go with this his wife was actually playing in the tournament as well and she also played a lopez slightly different than this uh but i got a very good position against her and i was able to win pretty decisively so i think he mixed it up and i think in general this is just kind of what he plays so it's quite normal um but yeah, so these days I didn't really play mainline Marshall very much. I could, I knew some theory, but it wasn't really my style, uh, to honestly, to play up the pawn. And what I mean is by playing the mainline Marshall, you play with c3, you allow d5, pawn takes, you grab this pawn, and then after c6, you can play d3 or d4, and then bishop d6, your rook goes back, black puts the queen on h4. So for example, let's say here. Queen h4, you play g3, queen h3, and life kind of continues. It's very, very sharp and interesting. But in general, black gets a lot of compensation for being down the pawn. And this was never really my style of play. I preferred to sack the pawn and not have someone sack against me. So in those days, I played various types of anti-marshals. And one of the ones I really enjoyed at that time was this move d4. So d4 is kind of an unknown move a little bit for a lot of people. But it's actually quite interesting. So there are lots of ways you can proceed here. Uh, you could take the pawn with the pawn. Uh, but the problem with this is that after e5, knight e8, I have several good options. I can play knight takes d4, which is most simple. I have bishop d5, which can be annoying. But in general, this knight on e8 is just not, not really great in this particular scenario. And the knight on c6 is pretty annoying because of the pin. So normally, they either play knight takes d4 if they don't play what he played in the game. Uh, I don't think d4 is necessarily not good, by the way. I think that it's, if black knows what they're doing, usually they get an equal position, right? But you could say that about almost any opening. So to call d4 bad is probably a bit much, but I would definitely say that there are different ways to play. So after knight takes d4, you can play knight takes d4, but there's also a very fun line where you play bishop takes f7 check, rook takes f7, knight takes e5. And the whole idea here is that if they try to move the knight back and you take on f7 you get you get a huge amount of play uh so for example if knight comes back knight takes and i think king e5 and already queen f3 check is coming like this is kind of a disaster so normally black just retreats and white's actually up a pawn here but black gets enormous compensation with something like this uh it's still very unclear even shook won a really really nice game in this line uh that's quite famous but in general i don't really care for it too much uh so i i you know knight takes d4 is the main thing i would play takes e5, knight e8, and here you have different options. You can play with c3 uh, and basically sacrifice a pawn in order to get activity, something like this, followed by knight d5, and you get a lot of activity for the pawn. Again, if black really knows what they're doing, they're probably just fine, but you could argue that about most lines. Uh, queen takes d4 is also quite playable, and the idea is that after c5, you play queen e4, hitting the rook on e8, and then black plays rook b8, 
and now you can play either C3 or C4. Both of which lead to kind of interesting games. The knight on E8 is definitely bad, but black also has a slight lead in development with other pieces because my queen side is not developed. Um, so I would say that it's definitely kind of an unclear position, but very interesting. Uh, most players, however, don't do e any of this. They Most players just play D6. And the reason for this is because black really, white really has nothing better than to defend the D pawn with C3. You can go for these kind of lines. These are This is actually quite playable. But black has all sorts of options. Like a lot of the options, I think they just even just take back and put the bishop on c5. And these end games are kind of harmless in general. So I would say that this is not the most um, interesting way to play, although it's definitely possible. Um, so you kind of play c3. And now you've actually transposed to what would be a c3 d4 Lopez. So the normal move order for this is, let's say, c3 d6. And most players play h3 here. And now there are lines like knight a5, which is Chigurin. There's rook e8, bishop b7, which is Zaitsev. There's knight b8, d7, which is Briar. Uh, this would be kind of the standard Lopez, which has existed for a long time. Um, but it, you can also have the option of playing d4 here uh, right away. And you kind of transpose to this, but the drawback is you allow bishop g4 as a move. So to give you an idea, that's actually what we transpose to, which is why most people play d6, because you transpose to this kind of sideline. Um, so now bishop g4 is played, and this pin is quite annoying on the knight. So there are two main options for white in a position like this. You can play d5, which is what I did, or you can play bishop e3. And bishop e3 is pretty interesting as a line. Like a lot of people, I'd say this is more common these days now. And one of the really common tricks here is that if what black tries to grab this pawn, it's actually a big mistake because you can play bishop d5, and you actually fork the two knights. So kind of a nice little trick. Uh, and again, this opening stuff is not necessary for the game. But, I, you know, a lot of people like to learn about openings. So I'm just kind of showing you some basics. So usually what black will do is they'll take and play knight a5 instead. And then either knight c4, bishop c1, c5, or c5 immediately. And they are try to combat the center that way and use the active bishop on g4. And these lines are quite interesting. I've had quite a few pretty crazy games in these lines. So d5 uh, was what I chose against Atalik. For what it's worth, for those of you who don't know, Suad Atalik, like, he's uh, a very, very experienced, very strong GM. Uh, originally from Yugoslavia, I believe, but now um, resides in Turkey. And very, very experienced, quite strong. And uh, I forget what his peak rating was, but, you know, quite a bit of experience. And at the time, I was a pretty strong IM, like 24-70 or so, but I definitely wasn't GM level yet. Um... So he was definitely the higher rated player and the, you know, the stronger player. And, um, but at the, at the same time, obviously, you know, we're just playing a game, right? So anything can happen. But yeah, this game, like both of us were actually analyzing this game, I think, at the table. Even though this game lasted, I think, about six hours almost. It was a very long game. We ended up analyzing this game at the table for like at least an hour. <laughs> even though we were both exhausted because of how uh, fun it was to play. So Bishop C2. Uh, you almost never want to give that, that bishop, now c6. And the whole point of c6 is that you're trying to undermine this d-pawn. If the pawn were already on c5, like you could even play c5 here if you so wanted. The problem is that now my central advantage with e4, d5 against e5, d6 is permanent. And that's not the end of the world. Like it's playable, but it's not really what black wants. If black can try to ch chip away at my center, it's definitely a lot better. And how's it going, chess king? So this is all kind of theory, but I'm just trying to explain the moves a little bit. Um, so, yeah, so white could play d takes c6, but it's actually considered a bit more accurate to play h3 first. At least it was back then. Uh, and the whole point is that now the bishop doesn't have a particular square. If you play d takes c6 first and say queen c7, which is the normal idea, and then h3, black has the option of playing bishop e6 straight away. And this is actually quite convenient because after h3, Black has a lot of options, but one option they don't have is bishop back to e6, which is the nicest square. Um, so if they can try many, many options here, by the way. Uh, you can play bishop takes f3 as a no move, and then you play queen takes, 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 and usually black tries to target this pawn, so they'll go for ideas like this. But white often will sacrifice it, and the two bishops will be quite a bit of compensation for this pawn. So again, this is playable. Black has the option of playing bishop h5 as well. But the drawback to this move is that sometimes later in the game, the bishop gets shot out of the game. 
and that tends to be a little unfavorable. But I would also say that this is definitely a possibility as well. Um, and there's also this move, bishop d7. And this move I actually faced. I, I, I played one of my favorite games that I've played against this move. And one of the cool tricks white has, I'll see if any of you actually find it, because I realize I've been babbling. And I like to ask questions even during these YouTube lectures. So what, would you, what do you guys think white ha has here? There's no win of a material or anything, but there's a really cute tactical trick, uh, which does something pretty neat. So basically, find a tactical trick for white that only wins the two bishops. <laughs> so what do you guys think? Very good. Yeah, so this is what happened in that game. I played knight takes e5. What's funny is, at the time, I didn't really know about this trick. So I just kind of had to find it over the board. But I found it, and then d6, and the idea is that you just win the two bishops, and it's not much, but usually you have a little bit of an advantage in these positions. So it's kind of a nice little trick in this line uh, that's worth noting. Uh, you can play... Yeah. So the main move, believe it or not, is bishop all the way back to c8. And this move, it looks really strange, but the idea is that your bishop doesn't want to get shot out of the game with h5. You don't want to give it up with bishop takes f3, and you don't want to play bishop d7 allowing the trick. So c8 becomes your only square. So a lot of people kind of play these moves without thinking, and I really like to know the purpose of why I'm playing moves in the opening or in any part of the game. So bishop c8 looks like such a strange move, and I, I wouldn't want to pass it by without explaining it. So it takes on c6, and now once again, you don't really want to take the pawn right away, because if you do, your knight on c6 is just not a good piece, because it's blocked by this pawn. There are a4 options sometimes, and in general, it's just harder to defend the d5 square, which is the weak square. If you take right away. If by the way, what opening would you say this resembles now more than a Lopez? Uh yeah, I'm sure Atalak annotates lots of games. Uh, I mean he's very, very famous GM as far as like he's done annotations, he's done a fair share of coaching, I wanna say, but he's also just been around a long time. Um and in general just a very high caliber of player. Yeah, I've known Suat a long time. Yeah, bishop d3, queen e2 is possible. Uh, but what, what opening does this resemble, would you guys say? It is just like a Sicilian, right? Kind of like a Nidorf, where, you know, black's gotten an a6, b5, but basically you have a Sicilian structure. You've traded the d-pawn for the c-pawn. I would say closest to a Nidorf. And it's really funny because people often don't realize that they're playing a Nidorf now. I definitely didn't when I played this way back when. So it's kind of funny when I look at it now, and I didn't realize I was playing a knight or um, as white. But yeah, I mean, once you know that the pawn structure changes and you're aware of it, it actually can help you play the positions a little bit better, I would say. Um, but yeah, just in general, it's you know it's good to know kind of why you're playing moves. So the whole point of queen c7 is that you really want to try to aim to control the d5 square a bit better. So after knight d2, and then queen takes c6, all of a sudden you're really controlling that square. And the knight often coming to c4 can be quite annoying. So um, in general, this is kind of the way what black wants to play. So I played knight f1. He played rook e8, which is normal enough. Just kind of an improving move. Like, it doesn't do anything too special, but it just improves the position. Yeah, and a lot of people don't, and you don't have to know opening names that well. But it's more that if you're aware of how a structure works, it helps you play it a little bit better. Um, the Lopez, incidentally, can transpose into so many structures. I've shown people how the Lopez can actually transpose into a Moran, which is a d4 opening. And they just don't believe it. They're like, how is this even possible? But it's a very versatile opening, which is one of the reasons why it's one of my favorites. Uh, this is the early c3, d4. I forget the technical name for it, but uh, without h3, basically, in the main line. So knight g3, knight to c4, and now a4, a very typical move in any kind of... Lopez position where you're basically trying to undermine the b5 pawn and make life a little bit uncomfortable for black So there are two main moves here one which I like bet a bit better is to play bishop e6 So you guard the d5 and f5 squares is the advantage of it um, And it's just kind of centralized. It's just kind of a nice square, right? Uh, you can also play bishop to b7 and bishop b7 has the advantage of 
being more active, so you're ready to kind of play d5 and try to target the pawn. The drawback of bishop b7, however, is that you allow knight f5, which is not something I'm crazy about. Um, so, yeah. So, knight to b6 was what he chose instead. And knight b6 is what I would call a provocative move. So, basically, he's... Um, he's attacking the a4 pawn, trying to force my hand and trying to improve his pieces, but he's not developing his bishop. He's not actually developing a piece. And during the game, I found this move to be very provocative. Like, I really didn't like it. And I, I just had an instinct for an initiative here. And I would say that my instinct was correct. Like, this move should not be that great. But I also think that I didn't quite execute it very well. And I think it's because I didn't calculate it well enough. So what I'm going to have you guys do is kind of do what I try to play like me, except play better, basically. <laughs> so this particular decision I made was correct, I think, because you have the choice here of taking on b5 or playing a5. So which move do you think uh, you would go for? So take a, take a minute maybe and decide between a takes b5 and a5, which move would you go for? So we have a couple A takes B fans, or three. Most guys want to take, okay. All right, we have one A5 guy, all right. Yeah, so it, it's actually a very difficult choice. I think uh, actually recently, I think it was Daniel Dubov or some guy like this had this as white, and he played A takes B5. And after pawn takes, rook takes, knight takes, the game kind of peered out to a draw. It's just not much is going on here, honestly. Like, you haven't really achieved much. I feel like a4 is kind of wasted. And yes, the knight's on a8, but it comes back to c7 or to b6 next move. I, I don't really think you're doing that much. And during the game, I wanted to try to get an initiative. And the advantage of a5 is that it, can, it keeps more pieces on the board, forces the knight to move again. And I feel like this is a better more initiative-driven move. It has positional risks, by the way, because if you play a5, you're taking pressure off the b5 pawn. So there are definite drawbacks to playing this move, but I feel like because you're getting this initiative, because you're cramping black's position a little bit, I think it's the better move. So this was what was played in the game, and I think this decision was correct. Knight bd7. And then this position is actually kind of interesting. So I played the move knight f5, which I felt had to be correct and looked natural. And it's probably not a bad move. Like, knight f5 can't be a terrible move. But I could have played this move knight h4. And the idea is that after g6, I play queen f3. And just the idea of having bishop h6 and knight f5 is just super annoying here. The queen on f3 is a very good piece. And if the knight ever moves, then I can sometimes put the bishop back to b3. And this pawn is also a target. So this kind of position actually could be very, very dangerous for black. Uh, but during the game, I plopped my knight on f5. I thought, how could this be wrong? And it's not terrible, but maybe not the most accurate. And now bishop back to f8, which is typical. That's the reason why black puts the rook on e8, by the way. And now bishop g5. So the idea of bishop g5 is I don't want him to be able to play knight c5 and target my pawn so easily. Because now his knight on f6 is attacked. So he can't just move his knight uh, so easily. And it means that this knight on f5 is hard to get rid of. So I was very happy with my position here. But my opponent definitely did not panic. He played bishop b7, um, just improving a piece. So I did the same thing. I played queen d2. And yeah, here he plays a move which maybe is a bit too much. Like, he probably has to try a move like h6 here. I understand why he didn't want to do this. I think he didn't want to make too many kingside moves here. But I think that the idea is that if bishop h4... Uh, and by the way, trying to sacrifice just doesn't work. I could try takes, takes, uh, but then knight h7, for example, and I don't really have enough of an attack here to justify this, so probably it's not the best. So probably here I should play bishop back to h4 instead, and then just rook c8. And 
it looks like I have a lot of pressure, but my follow-up's actually not so simple. And he's going to play b4 next. So I think one of you pointed this point, this idea out. And b4 might be really, really annoying with a, a takes b, b takes c coming in. Uh, I don't know, actually. Actually, maybe not b4 immediately because there's bishop a4. But b4 as an idea in general could be quite annoying. And d5 is always on the horizon. So it's actually not so easy to, to do anything amazing in this position. So maybe he should have tried this instead. He played queen c7, though, which actually is very logical. Um, but then here, I think, I came up with an idea, and I was very, very happy with my idea during the game. <laughs> but it's probably not objectively best. But you'll see why I was happy with it in a moment, because the whole concept is a little bit funny. Um, but what do you guys do here as white? I think that I have a way to play which is quite clear and, and quite decent. Knight h2 to g4 is really tempting. It looks really good to me. I, I like your idea. Rook d1 chess king. Exactly. And simply playing rook d1 is just good here. So I think during the game I was a little nervous about opening, leaving my a5 pawn. But honestly, this is kind of silly. Uh, I have a lot of ways to play here. But it turns out the best is actually bishop takes f6. And then a very nasty move, queen g5. And this move is just really all kinds of horrible. Because knight h7, knight h6 is going to be a whole lot of not fun. And in addition, rook takes f6 is a threat. Rook takes d6 is a threat. So for example, if king h8, you simply take on d6. And you can't ever take back because the g7 pawn. And here you're threatening this, you're threatening... Ugh, it's just horrible. Like, this is just dead. Um... Now, this isn't always so easy to see during the game. Like, you're not always looking for this kind of tactic, but this position is just atrocious, and nothing good will ever come of <laughs> of Black's position here. Um, yeah, exactly. Nice king, and the queen on a5 is really bad. So I think I think this is what worried me during the game, and I don't know why. I, d5 I looked at as well, but here I can actually just build, and probably this would be, maybe it was something I missed as well, that I can just play net h2, which was your idea before, uh, to Harry. But after it takes knight g4, and those knights are just really very awkward here. Uh, and the pressure on black's position is truly enormous. So I think that this position will be really, really unpleasant for black. Um, but yeah, I think that after maybe after d5, knight h2 is what I missed. Remember, I played this game about 14, 15 years ago almost. So <laughs> I don't remember everything perfectly, to say the least. But okay, bishop h4 is what I played. And this move looks extremely mysterious. Um, and if I look at it now, I'm kind of going, really? But I had a very, very, I would say, clever idea behind this move. So he played d5, and now, once again, I got too clever. I should just play the move bishop b3, and this move just looks really, really nice to me. Because the whole idea is that if you try a knight takes c e4, I can play takes and then knight g5. And I don't know if this is that easily winning. Or that I would spot it that simply. But it does look very good for white. And one of the key lines, which I definitely didn't see. This was something when I uh, computer checked it later. Was that after takes, takes, apparently the best move here by far is queen d1. g5 is not quite the idea. Uh, you'll see, Con. But, and apparently queen d1 is absolutely atrocious for black. Because queen h5 is coming. And if this move, then bishop g3, and this pressure on e5 is really annoying. And somehow black's position just completely falls apart here. Like, you just lose. Because, for example, if takes, I can simply play queen h5 and you get mated. And the pressure on e5 is really annoying. You're threatening just to take the rook at some point. Uh, apparently, this is just dead, dead lost. But this is not something that's easy for a human being to see right away. But I would say that if I had spotted bishop e3 in the exchange stack with knight g5, I think I would have gone for it. This just looks really, really good. And even if I don't spot this queen d1 move, I probably could have found my way to a good position here. So probably I should have gone this, but I was drawn to a particular idea. I played pawn takes d5, bishop takes d5. And here I played the move knight g5. 
And I think at this point he had a very confused look on his face. Because he didn't quite go what I was going for. The knights look threatening, but he plays h6. The question is, what was my idea here? What do you guys think? So knight takes f7 is possible, but I don't really understand what the idea is if, say, bishop takes f7. Do I have an idea here? Okay, you can take on h6, but I feel like you're actually just giving away your pieces because everything is very well defended for black. The pieces are all kind of grouped together nicely. So I definitely don't see how that works. So knight takes f7 is not correct. <laughs> no problem, Tahir. Thanks for tuning in at such an hour. Hope you don't regret it tomorrow, though. 4.25 a.m. Very good, Jonathan. Net H7. <laughs> I don't know. It, it's, it's one of those moves that you just really like playing because it, it's such a crazy move, right? And I remember, actually, uh, there was a game that I was at a, a chess camp where I was teaching, but I was I would sneak into, like at the time, I would think I was an FM, and I would sneak into GM's lecturing. And one of them was GM Alex Golden, who later became a coach of mine. And he had a game where he was showing how to play defense, and he had a game where he was black against Steven Chuk. And even Chuck threw this knight at, threw a knight h5 idea at him in a similar position, and it was this really powerful idea and got him a big positional advantage. And Golden managed to defend and draw. He's a very very good defender, but that game kind of struck me. So I thought knight h7 was like knight h5 on the next level, you know. But the, yeah, the idea is basically I'm not just trying to be cute. I'm trying to undermine the f6 knight. Is the whole idea. Um. So I was very, very happy with this move, I recall. Again, I wasn't sure it really led to anything special for me. I didn't think I was even that much that great, but I just recall really enjoyed playing the move. Uh, it's definitely one of the more unusual ideas that you can play a move like this in your opponent's territory where they have two pieces that can capture it, right? Um, but objectively, it's definitely like a decent idea. It's not bad, but it's not so easy to actually go anywhere. But one of the things you'll encounter about experienced GMs like Italic is that they never panic, almost ever. And a lot of players, I think, when they face a move like this, which they don't anticipate, and he definitely didn't expect it, uh, I don't believe, they often react poorly or they'll panic or they'll do something crazy, either too aggressive or too passive or something like this. But I would say that one of the really great things you can learn from Italic, who was black here, is that he did not panic at all. He just thought for a while and realized that he has to take with the king and took with the king. So my idea now was that I play knight e7 check, hitting the bishop. So I'm basically just winning my material back, right? But he plays bishop e4, which is a decent idea. Because he doesn't really want to let me take his bishop for free. If he moves his king back here, for example, and I take his bishop, this would be a big success for me. Because now I have the two bishops in a position where the two bishops look very, very strong. So I don't think he'd really want to allow a position like this. So he plays bishop e4. Uh, and here, once again, I continue kind of the aggressive trend. I play the move knight d5. So once again, the idea is that he can't take with the bishop. And if he takes with the knight, then... I don't know. I take, with the, I take on e4 with check, and I take the knight, and my two bishops again are very, very strong. So it's not really what he wants. So probably he should move his queen a different square than what he played here. Um... Maybe the best is queen c4, which actually forces me to play b3. 
which looks silly, but the idea is that after queen c6 now, rook takes e4, he can simply retreat. And the funny thing here is that he took the b3 square is now taken away from my bishop, and b and c3 is a weaker pawn. So believe it or not, provoking this b3 move is quite a quite an annoying idea. Um, but okay, this is again not something which I feel is so easy to see. Uh, but objectively, this is probably around equal uh, with best play. He played queen d6, which probably is less accurate. But here, unfortunately, I didn't give my other opportunities a fair shake. Like, I think at this point, I just really thought it was about equal. And again, I gave up on it and I ended up taking on f6. I remember being unhappy, but I actually have something stronger here. And maybe you guys can find it. So instead of knight takes f6, which is what I played and just tried to take the material back, I have kind of a better way to play, which may have led to a bit of an advantage for me. So what do you guys think? Rook e4 is interesting. I, I think that it would... I think, though, that he can take that. So if rook takes e4, for instance, I think he can take and then drop his king back. And I'm not really sure I'm getting that much for my exchange, to be honest. Like, I definitely have some kind of compensation, but I don't think it's so clear. So I, I wasn't sure this was the right way to, course of action. Bishop takes f6, then uh, I think bishop takes f6 allows... What? Maybe it would be similar. No, it wouldn't be. So he can't take back. So what was the deal on bishop takes f6? I think he was just going to take here. Yeah, I think this was the issue. He would simply take this. And now if queen takes, simply go back to h8. And I have a couple pieces hanging here, which is a little bit unfortunate for me. So I think I had to be careful. I don't think bishop takes f6 works as well. None of you guys have it quite yet. But... Maybe, but remember, you're just winning an exchange back at most, right? You're not winning a whole piece back. So I can play knight takes f6, knight b6, queen c6, take the rook, queen takes or something, and I have two pieces for a rook there. So it's a nice idea, but I don't I don't think it quite pans out. Um, this move is actually absurdly simple and obnoxious almost. I can actually play the move rook ad1 here. And believe it or not, this is actually just strong because... He doesn't really have a great move, it turns out. The best move, thing he could try is to move his king, because he just doesn't really have another improving move. If he tries taking and I take, now knight takes f6 is a huge problem, and he just loses. Uh, he doesn't really have a great improving move, like knight takes f6 is always in the air. He has to always be careful of that. So even though I'm not threatening anything outrageous, it's just a really strong improving move. So his best shet, bet is to play king g8, and now I could play bishop takes e4 and then rook takes e4, and I think I have a nice advantage here because my knight on d5 is very, very strong. And my rooks are very, very good in the center. I worry a little bit about my bishop on h4, but I don't know. It's not so easy to actually trap that thing. And I feel like my pieces in the center are going to be very, very good here. So I think this gives me like a bit of an advantage. Maybe not decisive or anything crazy, but definitely I still would be a little bit better. Um, at the very least, I would take white in that position. Um but I didn't find it, and I liquidated too early. So now the game actually fizzles out into an endgame. And I remember being quite disappointed here. Because takes, takes here, rook d1. He plays bishop c7, and we trade to this endgame. And I remember being disappointed, because I'm like, oh man, this, this is so dull compared to what we were having before. Um, but it turns out this endgame also becomes very, very interesting. And in fact, in the end, it became one of the more interesting rook end games uh, that I've played. But let's see how we got there, first of all. So I played the move b4. And this move is pretty normal. I mean, I don't really want to give up the a5 pawn. It's not necessary, but I definitely think this move makes sense. He plays e4. So basically, he's saying that he wants to put a bishop on e5 and target my pawn which makes a lot of sense. 
So I play the move bishop e7 so that I don't end up getting my bishop trapped or anything embarrassing. Bishop e5. And when I looked at this position later, this is one of those things where I think that back then I was a bit of a different player than I am now. Uh, one of the things I would say is that back then I was never too materialistic. But I would say that back then I valued material a bit more and structure a bit more than I do now. And I valued activity a bit less. Uh, I've definitely become a player who values activity more than I used to. So I think that here I would make a different decision if I had this game today than back then. Um, and it's not just even about strength. Like I'm definitely, you know, at least at some point, you know, I became a, a stronger player than I was then, maybe 100 points higher or so. Um, you know, but not that I was so much, I'm so much stronger now. It's more that I view chess a little differently. So I think that the decision I made then is different than the one I would make now. Um, not even just because of I'm stronger, but because of chess style is just different. So chess style could really influence your decisions, I guess is the main point I'm making. Um, but what would you guys do here? Because you have a couple different options on how to play here. So, so you were clear. I mean, the game should probably end in a draw, but at the same time, there's still plenty of life left. And for sure, Atalik is one of those players who is very, very ambitious, especially against low-rated players, about playing for the win. Um, and he doesn't like to give up draws against almost anyone. So he's someone who is always going to be pressing his absolute hardest to win. And again, I think this is a quality of his that you can uh, try to emulate in your own games. Because... You could definitely feel the pressure when you play him more than some other players who might be very strong, but don't necessarily try to beat you so badly. So rook d8 I don't really like. Uh, the main reason is that if rook d8 simply takes, 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 and I think I'm just down a pawn here because I have to defend and then f5 and king f7, king e6. It feels like I might just lose this position, to be honest. So I think this would be not the correct approach. So I don't really like rook d8 check. Um... So what else can we do? Rookie one is interesting, but the problem with rookie one is I think, I don't know. There are a couple issues. First of all, I'm not so crazy about this allowing this pin. I feel like allowing this pin is asking for trouble. Maybe it doesn't lead anywhere, but I would be very nervous about allowing this pin because bishop takes b4 is a threat. If f3, then f5 is a thing. I am I would not be happy with this pin. So that's at least one reason. I also am not sure about the move f5, and then bishop takes c3 as a tempo move. So if I try f3, for example, this is a tempo, and bishop d4 checks also a tempo. So I don't really like rookie one either. So rook d7 has been suggested. I like that move. Uh, I would prefer a slightly different version of it, which is to play bishop c5 first. So you allow black to capture your pawn and then play rook d6. And I like this move better because it pins the rook down on a8 because now the pawn on a6 is always hanging. And if you lose the a6 pawn, by the way, you're probably just dead lost because then the a pawn's way too strong. So when you can force your opponent's rook to just sit on this square for the rest of their life, you're probably doing just fine even if you're down a pawn. And now, for example, if they try to go f5, you can play g4 and try to undermine their pawns. You try to bring your king into the game. And it's just very limited what black can ever do here. Because it's so difficult for black to ever get the rook in the game. Because rook takes a6 is always just going to be very strong. So I would say that this is probably what I would do now. Something like this. And who knows? Maybe he wouldn't actually just take right away. Maybe he would try something else. But the fact is that... Maybe next move I'm ready to play rook e1. Maybe next move I have rook d5 or rook d7, as you suggested. And I don't know. I don't think it's going to end up making a huge difference, to be perfectly honest. I can play moves like g4 if I want next move. It's no problem. Um, so I don't know. I would say that this would be a very, very clear path towards a draw. And I think that nowadays I would really value my rook activity quite a bit more. Uh, back then, I don't think I was as devoted to that. So I played the move rook c1. Basically, I just want to get in the move c4. So he plays f5, improving his position, and I play c4. But the fact is that this is nice. I, like, I really wanted to be able to play c4 and then b5 and get a very strong a pawn. But this is just not quite realistic, because after rook c8, I really don't want to play c5 myself, because then my bishop's going to end up trapped. So I play bishop back to c5. But now after takes, takes, I really can't push anything. He plays king e6, 
And the problem is that because my this pin and my rook being kind of passive, I can't ever really play b5. So even though I thought this was good because I'd be able to get in b5, now I realize that, well, wait a second, now he just brings his king into the game, and what am I doing with my life, you know? <laughs> um, because his king just becomes very, very strong now. And I think this is something which I appreciate a lot more now than I did then, the, the idea of king activity. It sounds basic, but the fact is that his king coming into the game now is just a real pain. So I played g4, which is correct. I have to try to undermine these really strong pawns of his. So king e6. King power, exactly. So I take on f5. And here I make kind of an interesting choice. Once again, I think that now maybe I wouldn't play this move. <clears throat> uh, because nowadays, like... I would really, like, back then I remember thinking that, okay, I have to try to draw this position. I remember thinking that now. Because I, I didn't really like my rook c1 move after I played it. So I liked his king better. So I thought, okay, you should be trying to draw. So I thought, okay, trade as many pawns as you can. I should preface this by saying that should draw. The way I played should be okay. But I also think that it's not really necessary because his pawn on e4 is actually a weakness, I would say. So, for example, if I play something like king f1 and just, say, march my king to e3, probably I'm just going to draw pretty easily, right? Like, the e-pawn is just kind of weak here, and I don't think I would really struggle to draw this too much. But I don't know. I mean, bishop f4 check, it's not that clear. Uh, I did play f3, yes. Uh, and again, I don't think it's a bad move. I, I should still draw fairly comfortably, to be perfectly honest. But it's also um, not so easy now. Like, it definitely becomes, you know, more complicated. So, takes on f3. King f2. Bishop back to d6. And here, king takes f3. And again... We have enough reduced material. It It's getting closer and closer to a draw. But at the same time, it's also getting close to a position where I have to be very careful. So he took and played rook c6. And once again, I would say that I'm the definitely the one who has to be careful. The problem when you review games like this with a computer is they tend to just say 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 all the time. And I'm not saying they're wrong. But it also means that you're the one who has to play accurately here. And I really think that this position... Uh, I should probably play the move h4. Now, I was understandably hesitant to push pawns, but the fact is that preventing black from playing, putting a pawn on g5 and playing this way is actually kind of nice. Uh, because say if black plays g5 now, I can simply take it and then say bring my rook back. And I think that my it's just really hard to ever win because black can try to go after my pawn. But the problem is that he's just... I'm way too close. So even though, yes, black is definitely better... I am I draw by a couple tempi here. So my king gets to be one easy draw. Uh actually that's a great question. So I expected him to play g6. I should point this out. I expected g6, but I think his move is quite a bit stronger. Because if he does this now and I go for this, this is now a really, really good idea. And this is kind of why I played it in the game, by the way. Because after it takes king here, now his f pawn is actually a bit of a weakness, believe it or not. And his pawns are just split and a lot weaker in a position like this. So I actually think this is what I planned, and this is what I think is actually good for me. So I actually think that the way he played with king e6 was underestimated and probably a better try to win. Again, it's all drawn, right? So it's all kind of relative. But that's at least what I would say about it. Um, so... Takes on f5, takes f3. So yeah, king f1 I mentioned, f3, I come out. So yeah, h4 I think would be clear. And he could play something like g6, h5, and try to win that way. But quite honestly, it's just very difficult because his pawns are always going to be kind of weak. And I could try to always attack them with my rook, for example. So it's just going to be very, very difficult for him to ever try to win this, I would say. Uh, again, I don't want to say that it's that easy, right? Because it's obviously not. But probably h4 would be a better try. 
um, to draw here. So, uh, but, but Chess King, what I mean is that Black's definitely better here because, like, okay, I'm the one who has to try to draw, right? So I'm not, like, dead equal yet, right? The computer will say zeros because it is a draw, but I'm the one who has to draw with accurate play. Black is not. So that's what I mean by black is better. Um, so rook f4 check, king d6, rook g4 is what I tried. And this, I'd say, is a lot less accurate. But even after g5, even here, I think that I could have... This was the last moment I could have really secured a drawish position by force. And the question is, what move should I play here? Because the move I chose was definitely wrong. Oh, the king and pawn in game, yeah. You can call that a draw. You don't get to say white's really better. Black's really better there, I would say. So. So what would you do here as white? Because, again, it's kind of a tricky situation. But... So h4 is what I played, unfortunately, which turns out not to be so accurate. Um, to be honest, already I was very unhappy with my position, and I probably didn't look for my resources enough. Uh, Terry, you're correct. Rook b4 is a very, very good move here. Because if rook c4, king d5, I haven't really helped myself. But rook b4 is actually quite good. And the idea is that if takes, of course, then rook b6 check, I could take on a6, and it's quite a dead draw, most likely. So he plays... Oops. So king d5 is a better try. And now I play king g4. And believe it or not, this position is probably just drawish. Because he can play rook takes e5, but then rook here and takes. And this position is just so hard to do anything. Because he has to defend the g5 pawn all the time. So even though we have a couple extra pawns on the board, the extra pawns actually make the draw easier for me, not harder. Because say if king d4, right? I could just play rook g6, and I'm not even threatening to take. I just am waiting. So like king d3, I just play here. And I basically just wait. And the problem is, if the rook moves this way, then his pawn hangs. If the rook moves this way, then this pawn hangs. And there's just no good way to move the rook. And if you can't move that a5 rook, it's going to be pretty tough to win. And black could play king takes c5. But now I simply can go back with the rook, I think. And there's just not really much to do. The king goes to h5, and again, like... You're just not really... You can't ever really make a threat. Because <laughs> my king is just so active and so strong. And to ever get winning chances there would be quite good. <laughs> uh, yeah, no problem, uh, Go Godi. Uh, okay, so h4. You're welcome, guys. I am glad you uh, enjoy the content here. But believe it or not, there's still some tricks to go. This game... The complexity, like, the fact is that the middle game was complex in this, but I think the end game was even more complex. And I won't have time to go through every single detail in this end game, believe it or not. It is so complicated. But rook takes c5 was played, and now rook b4, king d5. And maybe here I should just play rook b6 immediately, just so his rook has to go back because his h6 pawn hangs, and then just come back, and maybe this was a better try. But okay, I took the pawn and played king g4 which I thought was logical at the time. And here, he, again, made things unnecessarily complicated. He could have just taken this pawn, and honestly, this position is probably just very good for him. So, for example, if I try rook b6, trying to, you know, help myself here, he plays this, and if I go rook here, he plays check. And the problem here is that these pawns are just so hard to actually stop. And even if he ends up sacrificing one of them, like here he doesn't have to. This is just Even if I take one of them, right? Like the problem is that he's just too fast. He plays his rook up, he plays his pawn up, and my pieces are just not in the right position even remotely here. So a position like this, even I think rook a1 is correct. And the problem is a5, like even if I try to bring my king back, a5, this pawn is just coming way too fast. And my king is not going to be nearly good enough here. So a position like this, usually you're able to win. Um, I believe pretty, pretty effectively. 
But I think that this is just something he was not sure of. So in the game, he played rook b5, which may be good enough. But it gave me some hope. So I played rook a4. And believe it or not, this is a case where, again, I don't fully understand all of this endgame. But I think it's very important for him to play king d6 so that if I play rook a1, he can play the move rook e5. And now he's able to bring his king over to safety. And his rook on e5 is very, very good. The problem with his king e6 move is I play rook a1. And now all of a sudden, it's not so easy for him to actually do this. So he gets kind of a similar situation to that. Like he'll play a move like rook e5 later. But the problem is that his king becomes very passive. He tries king f6. Oh, rules of thumb. It's really, really difficult. Like... Um, yeah, oh, I would say you cannot simplify rook and pawning as rook, and I'll show you why. Like, even in the game, it becomes immensely complicated. I would say that you generally want to have an eye on the pawn and be able to check from the side. Uh, if you can get your king in front of the pawn, obviously you draw that way, but like, if your king's on the side, you often draw, but there are times when the rook can cut you off. There's also a rule where if you have a rook cutting off the pawn here, and they cut you off on the E file, you lose. But if they cut you off on the D file, you draw. Which sounds really strange. It would take a while to explain all of it. But there are lots of different rules. I would say, though, that every situation is a bit unique. So you can't just use one rule of thumb for all the positions. You have to be, you have to calculate them very well. And you'll see this, because again, like, think about this. Suat like, is an extremely experienced GM. He's studied countless rook end games. And he actually ended up messing up this rook game at the very end. Uh, I wasn't able to take advantage, but even very, very strong players get this wrong. So to simplify it is very difficult. You have to just really learn them uh, quite well, the specific situations. But here I came up with a good idea. I decided to part with my A pawn, check, and then just sit. And the problem he realized here is that sitting is actually quite annoying because once again, his rook on A5 is just very, very passive here. It can't really move. So... He tries to shoo away my rook, but the fact is that it's not so easy to actually do that. Because now I just give checks, and he goes back, and now he comes up. Because he realizes that he can't make progress unless he brings his king up and sacks the g-pawn. So this is the only real way to try to play for a win here. So he does it. I take the pawn, rook a1, and this was a really crucial decision for me. How... Should I try to draw this? And a lot of this is about knowing your rule with these endgames. So how would you try to draw here as white? What move would you play? Because this is largely about knowing these endgames really well. And I have to confess, I knew I didn't know rook endgames too badly. I worked on them a lot with my first coach. so And I studied endgame manual and stuff. But this endgame was a little weird with my king up. And I have to definitely say that I didn't know these A-pawn things as well as I do now um, back then. But even now, I would say I could definitely screw this up because it's really easy to do. Um, all right. Rook a5 is possible, but keep in mind his king wants to move up anyway, so unless I have a specific idea in mind, rook f5 doesn't really help me. And keep in mind, like, it's helpful to look at these positions with the table base, but the problem is that it'll give you sometimes draw, like if you have lots of drawing moves, it'll sometimes give you drawing moves which you should never ever play because they're so complicated. Like, there's usually a good or known way to try to draw it, which is what a human being can grasp onto. So rook f3 then king f5 doesn't really help you, I don't think, because the king will simply park itself on d4 and then push the a pawn, and I think that that's going to be very, very difficult to, to draw. Because your king on f5 doesn't actually do that much. So again, I, I can't say for sure whether things are drawing or winning because even these, like this position is that complicated. It looks simple, but yeah, I definitely like, the thing is I would say the side checks are what you want. So this is a very good rule of thumb for you guys. You want to be hitting your opponent's pawn. 
The main reason for this is it makes it very difficult for them to ever move their rook to, say, d1. If they could play rook d1 and shield their king, say, and do it this way, they'd probably win pretty easily. But it's very important to keep their king to that pawn. So my rook is actually already on a good square. So really, I actually want to improve my king more than anything else. So you can't go to the f-file because this would be just embarrassing. <laughs> I just lose, right? Take, take, and I'm with in the square but unfortunately this king cuts me off so I just lose so the best move here is king g4 because the rook has to stay glued to this pawn now and that's really the key so you can play rook g1 check but after king h3 he hasn't actually solved anything he either has to bring the rook back or he has to go here but now I just keep giving checks right so I'll just check check for a million years and if he tries to come too close now I'll probably Exactly, actually, which way am I going here? Now I think I come back, right? And the idea is that if his rook comes back, that's great. But now I just sit here. And the problem he has is that he really can't make progress. Like, he can come after my rook, right? But it's going to be very, very tricky to actually do anything. So let's say he comes here and comes here, and I'm just sitting, right? If he tries to come after my rook this way, I go this way. If he comes here, I have to not allow this, right? But I just come back. And even though my king's cut off so much, like, how does he actually make progress? So what does he actually do here, right? He has to probably try to go backwards. And then after check, 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 maybe try to put his king here. But now he's going to have a trickier time. I guess he can try this, but then I come here. I have to make sure this is a move, though, I guess. That's very important. So I don't even know if this is the best way to try to draw. Because my king's cut off a very long way here, guys. So maybe this is actually not the clearest draw. But I would say uh, here... What's the best way to do this, actually? Ah, uh, Maybe it's actually just to attack the pawn from the side. So something like this may be clearest. Yeah, yeah. So if the rook moves back, my king moves back. If here I just attack from the side again, here I attack from the side again. So notice how the pawn can't go up, so you have to come back. And now I can simply park my king here. And this is a known draw, where my rook's hitting the pawn and my king's here. So this is probably a bit better. Yeah. So anyway, this is very complicated stuff, though, and needless to say, because I'm definitely going to be getting this wrong myself sometimes. But okay, a5 would be the logical attempt to win. And now, once again, you could check putting the rook here. Very important. And then king here. So the same idea, right? Here, you can play rook f4 check, but this is probably the simplest. Because again, I have this idea. And if king here, I play here to make sure I have this idea. Always line up with the pawn. Because if you ever allow the rook to leave, that's how you lose, right? So you have to make sure the rook can... Yeah, so I'll demonstrate it because it can happen in the game, right? But the basically known, the known draw goes like this. You go here, and you're hitting the pawn from the side. So the whole idea is that, this is called the Vancura defense. So the whole idea is that if they check you, you go here. If they go here, you just wait. And the whole point is that if they try to go near the pawn, so say they do this, now you just give checks till the end of time. And you actually can check this way pretty much till the end of time. If they go here, for example, if they try to go to here, now you can just move somewhere, right? So say rook b3. If check, you go up. If here, they go back. If rook king b4, you check. And this is kind of the known drawing position, the known drawing motif, right? So I actually want to go because I uh, want to ask you one last question because in the game, I played a bad move. I played the move rook f2, which is kind of silly. I wanted to bring my king in. But this is absolutely the wrong trying to draw. So he plays a5, I play king g4. Yeah, here I realized that this was just not going to cut it. Like if I play here, he can simply go here. And I'm just doing nothing. My king's not going anywhere. If check here, I can't even go king here because he checks me, right? So I have to move again. And then he goes here. And then I realize my king's just terrible. So this would just be not what I wanted. So I tried king g4. a4, rook f5 check. King g3. a3. He's playing it well so far. But then this was the moment. If he plays king e4, he actually wins pretty simply. And eventually he did. 
Eventually he figured it out. And I actually knew this at the time. So I knew that I was losing here because this position I knew was a loss. But then he played king e2 and I thought, but I had about five minutes and I could not figure out like how I could draw this. But I actually do have a drawing method here and I wanted to give you guys an opportunity to find it because it is crazy. So white to play, how do you draw this position? Because I saw the correct move, but I missed one really, really nasty idea, which is really, really a funny one, actually. It's really funny though, right? Like the the middle game was so complicated, but the most po complicated part of this game and most interesting part was maybe even this at rook end game where we had rook and pawn against rook. That's correct, Chess King. So you play Rook B3. And this holds against a lot of things. If check, you have King H2. If And if the king were on G2, by the way, this would be a known defense. So with the king on G2, I knew it was a draw. But I thought with the king here, I lost. Because I saw that after Rook G1 check king here, I could draw. Because if here, I can check and take this pawn, right? No problem. So what the move I didn't like was A2. And here, I thought that the problem is if if rook here with the king here, you draw easily, right? But in this position, you can't because now I can simply check here and queen. The question is, what draw did I miss? Oh, queen versus rook endgame, no. Honestly, I think with a, for a human being, have, playing rook versus queen when you have no time is just impossible. But white has a really, really amazing draw here. And yes, queen versus look as a rust for the rook. I would say that playing with the rook with no time is almost impossible. Also, it's easy to just lose it. Um, but then again, of course, the chances of drawing are not zero. Um, but okay, I actually have a technical draw here. And it's a really funny idea if you haven't seen it. And I think at the time I had not seen this idea, so I just completely blanked it. To be Again, to be fair, I had like under five minutes, so it's really hard to find all this. One of the things I don't like about modern time controls, like this this time control was longer, but I would say more modern time controls, like you just have no time when you get an endgame, so you can never play it well, which I kind of hate. So rook b2 is correct, but the question is what do you do after? Because let's say king d3, right? I can't check again, because then here I'm just going to lose. Um, I can't play king g2 because now simply rook check and queens and now I lose. So what do I play? Very nice. So now, because there's no rook g2 check, rook g1 check, he actually has no way to move the rook or pawn. So he can try this, trying to go here, but now I play king g4, and the funny thing is I can just check him like this. So if he tries to go here, I give a check. If here, I come back. And believe it or not, this idea draws. Because if he tries to come close to the rook, I stay here. If he tries to move away, I go here, and then I do this. So believe it or not, this is actually a draw. Alas, in the game, I did not find this. I played rook f2 check. King e1, rook f3. He plays rook a2. And unfortunately now, again, I have the opportunity to play rook b3 and draw. 
But I played Rook F2 check, and finally he found the right idea. And I did see this during the game, and I was hoping he wouldn't realize it. But this position is, a is actually a win, because I have to put the Rook on A4 is the problem. My Rook needs to be on F3 with my King here. That's the draw. But because here I have to do this, I just don't have a choice. If I try to go back now, he can simply check me and play here, right? And then I lose. So I have to go to a4, and now he simply slides his king over, and I'm too slow. Like, I can play king g2. I did this, right? But if I play king g2 now, I'm simply too slow, because if here, I just don't have time to slide the rook over. If I try to go here, he simply goes here, for example. Just for instance. And now I just lose, right? Because if I go here, his rook goes here, here, and his king comes up, and this is just lost. So very unfortunate. I don't know if D1's the best square. Maybe c one slightly more accurate. But it's the same concept, right? So there's just no way to actually draw this position. I try this. Yeah, rook g2 is pretty funny, huh? <laughs> but it's a nice way to draw. So I just tried to bring my king closer. But unfortunately, he's one tempo too quick. Because he has rook b1. And this is where the rook cutoff doesn't work, by the way. When he has rook to b1, this is the best square for the rook. So if, I, if his rook were like here, it would be a draw. Because his rook could never get to b1 without allowing me closer. But because his rook's on b1 already, it's already a loss. So here, rook b3. I try here, but now he simply plays king b2. King here. I can't trade rooks. a2, and I resigned. Because, of course, I could try to play like rook here. But the problem is then he plays rook b2 check. I have to go up, and then king up, king up, king up. There's just nothing I can do here. And thus, I lost one of the most crazy games probably in my career. But it was a lot of fun to play this game. It was. It kind of reminds me a lot of one of the a lot of the things I enjoy about playing chess too. Uh, and I hope you guys enjoyed it and could kind of learn from my mistakes. And uh, it was again, it was a really fun game and uh, just a lot of fun to to play around with it. So I hope you guys enjoyed it and stay tuned for my next lecture, which is on uh, a game from the candidates. So stay tuned. I'm going to put that up right away. It was painful, but at the same time, like, I really... It wasn't a great tournament for me overall. It just, I didn't play that well. So the tournament was disappointing, but I was never really sad about playing this game because I thought it was such a fun game to play and I enjoyed going over it. I learned a lot from it. So it's the kind of game that you actually really like playing, even though you lost. Um, there are plenty of losses which were far more painful, I would say.